Ladies and gentlemen, have you ever wondered why one drink never seems like enough? Now, what if I told you that it isn't actually a lack of willpower, but it's science, specifically your opioid receptors? Yep, that's right. The same system that's targeted by drugs like morphine and heroin is in play every single time you have a drink. So today we're decoding how alcohol hijacks your opioid receptors and lures you into a cycle that you can't easily escape. By the end of this video, you'll understand why alcohol is not just another drink. It's a master manipulator of your brain's deepest mechanisms. This is information that you cannot afford to ignore. And just before we get into the video, if you want help stopping drinking without AA or therapy or rehab or willpower or anything like that, and you want to do it in a different way that focuses on reframing how you view alcohol, as well as using coaching to really focus on building a great future without it, please go ahead and click the link in the description. There'll be a link there where you can actually book a call and you and I can jump on a call together and really see if working together could be a good match. We've worked now with hundreds of people and 96% of our clients say that they would recommend us to a friend. So if you want details, go ahead and click the link in the description to book a call or just go to soberclear.com. And now back to the video. So our brain cells communicate with each other and other parts of the body through a complex molecular signaling system. This system has two main components, neurotransmitters and receptors. So neurotransmitters are specialized messaging chemicals that our brain cells can produce. They then transmit these neurotransmitters to neighboring cells, activating structures on their surface called receptors. So when the receptors are activated, they initiate various electrophysiological events that influence the receiving cell's behavior. Think of neurotransmitters as the key and receptors as the lock. The signaling cell sends out the key, the neurotransmitter, and then the receiving cell checks to see if the key matches the lock on its surface, and that is the receptors. So if the key doesn't fit the lock, then the lock will not turn. In other words, the three-dimensional shape of the neurotransmitter molecule must match the shape of the receptor. Otherwise, it will simply not activate it. Now, there are hundreds of different neurotransmitters that our body naturally produces, and each of these will only activate a specific receptor or subset of receptors. And one of the classes of neurotransmitters are so-called endogenous opioids endogenous as in coming from within or naturally produced within the human body. There are three families of these compounds, beta endorphins, encaphalins, and dynorphins. There are three main types of opioid receptors which these endogenous opioids activate, and they all have Greek names. They are called mu, delta, and kappa receptor. So these receptors are widely distributed through the brain, nervous, and digestive systems. When they are active, these receptors produced one or more of the following things. Pain relief, sleepiness, relaxation, and euphoria. Endogenous opioids are actually essential to human survival. By activating the opioid receptors, they regulate our responses to pain, help us control stress, anxiety, and various negative emotions. They are also involved in producing feelings of pleasure. So just as important, endogenous opioids are a crucial component of the brain's so-called reward system. The reward system is a network of interconnected brain areas that regulate the rewarding experience that we derive from things that were crucial to our survival throughout evolution. The main ones being food, water, sex, and sleep. So endogenous opioids directly stimulate the reward system via the opioid receptors that are found there. But they also do this indirectly by activating other circuits of the brain that in turn regulate the activity of the reward system. Now enter synthetic opioids. So remember that in order to activate the opioid receptors, you need an endogenous opioid. Well, it turns out that there are some naturally occurring plant substances that resemble the three-dimensional structures of endogenous opioids. So because of this, when ingested, they mimic the actions of endogenous opioids. Depending on the type of substance and the dosage, they can actually produce effects far stronger than those of endogenous opioids. Scientists call these compounds exogenous opioids. That is opioids that are found out side of the human body. Historically, the use of exogenous opioids goes back to antiquity, starting with opium. Now, this is a juice that's extracted from the unripe seed pods of the poppy plant. Opium was originally used for medical purposes, like sedation and pain relief. But from the Middle Ages and onwards, it was increasingly used for recreational purposes. It relaxes the body and induces a dreamy euphoric state. By the turn of the 20th century, one out of every four adult men in China were hooked on opium. As addictive as opium was, it was nothing compared to morphine, which was isolated from opium around 200 years ago. A much more potent painkiller, it also gives a stronger high and has a higher potential for addiction. In 1874, an even more potent opioid, 
heroin was extracted from morphine. Heroin has little medical use, but is widely abused as a recreational drug. And sadly, today the use of heroin in prescription opioids like fentanyl and oxycodone has reached epidemic proportions in the United States. Up to 75% of drug overdoses in this country involve opioids. The total number of opioid-related deaths rose from under 10,000 in the year 2000 to nearly 70,000 people in 2020. This is a seven-fold increase in the span of just two decades. Along with these deaths, the epidemic has caused untold amounts of societal pain and ripped entire communities apart. It is actually one of the largest social and medical disasters that America has ever seen, and the media are mostly silent about it. So anyway, let's now touch on alcohol and the opioid system. You see, alcohol's primary target is not the opioid system, but a different neurotransmitter system called GABA. Now, in the description, I have links to a prior video that we made about alcohol and GABA, so I'm not going to go into details again today. So originally, researchers assumed that alcohol acts almost exclusively through the GABA system, but various pieces of evidence began to challenge this view. And one key piece of evidence was a drug called naltrexone. Discovered in the 1960s, naltrexone acts by blocking the activation of the mu opioid receptor. Think of it as a copy of a key that is good enough to go inside the lock, but not good enough to turn the lock and open the actual door. Now, trexone is similar enough to endogenous opioids that it can bind to the mu opioid receptor, but it's not similar enough to activate it. With the receptors blocked by naltrexone, they cannot be activated. So this leads to a decrease in the activity of the endogenous opioid system. Naltrexone was eventually licensed for the treatment of heroin addiction in 1982. But after a series of experiments with rats, scientists soon realized that the drug had a potential for the treatment of alcoholism. This led to the FDA approving it for this indication in 1994. Though it's not a wonder the drug by any stretch of the imagination. For some detoxified heavy drinkers, naltrexone may help reduce cravings and prevent relapse. And for those who do continue to drink, naltrexone can help reduce bouts of heavy drinking. Another line of evidence for the link between alcohol and the opioid system came from studies with rats. It's normally relatively easy to get captive mice to start self-administering alcohol, usually by pressing a lever. They can do this to the point of becoming completely hooked on the ethanol. Well, it turned out that rats who were genetically modified so as to not have functioning opioid receptors could not actually develop an addiction to alcohol. You just couldn't get them to keep on pressing the lever, in contrast to your normal mice with an intact opioid system. But the question is, how? How is it possible that a drug which acts exclusively on opioid receptors can have any effect against alcoholism? And why is it that you need a functioning opioid system in order to develop an addiction to alcohol in the first place? So next, let's look at the reward system and beta endorphin. Now, the answer came when scientists found that in rats, alcohol directly increases the levels of the endogenous opioid, beta endorphin. Beta endorphin has various functions, which include inducing euphoria, decreasing stress, managing pain, and regulating reward behaviors. It binds to the same kind of opioid receptors as morphine. So in very simplistic terms, you could say that it's our body's natural version of morphine. So the increase in beta endorphin levels takes place in various parts of the brain, including the reward system, making it, well, very rewarding. As a result of these brain changes, the levels of beta endorphin in the blood also rise. These changes are fast and fleeting, lasting up to about 20 minutes after a drink. So what happens is you get a rapid rise that soon fades, leading you to crave another drink. Now, later studies confirmed that these effects, first discovered in rodents, also take place in humans. Now, you have probably heard somewhere, or seen one of our early videos, where we mentioned that the primary neurotransmitter involved in the reward system is dopamine. So, you might be wondering where beta endorphin fits in. Well, the answer is that our brain is very complex, and no system works in isolation. It's the same with the reward system. Though, the major neurotransmitter in play here is dopamine. The reward system works through various neurotransmitters transmitters and receptors. It's also connected to and influenced by numerous parts of the brain. So scientists have long known that consuming alcohol raises the level of dopamine in the reward system. In the early days, they had a very simplified view of how this happens. But they slowly realized that you can influence these levels of dopamine through the several other neurotransmitter systems. And then in recent years, they have found that if you administer alcohol with an opioid blocker, the rise in dopamine levels in the reward system is blunted, reduced. So it appears that alcohol uses the opioid system to work on the reward system in two ways. Firstly, directly through the increase in beta endorphin, and secondly, indirectly, with the opioid system regulating the rise in dopamine levels that accompanies drinking. Over the years, the opioid system of heavy drinkers 
changes. This is a natural reaction to the continued presence of ethanol. The brain at some point learns to anticipate that soon there will be another wave of ethanol sweeping in its path and raising the levels of beta endorphins. So in its infinite wisdom, our brain decides to, you guessed it, lower its baseline levels of beta endorphin production. This process is called downregulation. In very simple words, downregulation means that the activity of a neuronal system, like the opioid system, is reduced. And this reduction happens in reaction to an external stimulus, in this case, alcohol. So we already know how chronic alcohol use also downregulates several other neurotransmitter systems, most notably dopamine and GABA. So you have a very nasty mix of several downregulated neurotransmitters, to which you then add beta endorphin and things become become even worse. Studies that use blood samples have confirmed that the beta endorphin levels of heavy drinkers in withdrawal are lower on average than those of matched controls. And as a rule, the lower a recovering heavy drinkers levels of beta endorphin, the higher their stress levels. Similarly, the lower the levels of beta endorphin, the higher one's cravings for a drink. But the effects on craving are not as strong as on anxiety, where beta endorphins seem to play a crucial role. So what about recovery? Well, if you look at any high-end rehab facility, you will see that not only do they almost always have a gym, but they've got loads of other facilities to encourage physical activity. Swimming pools, tennis courts, badminton, squash, bicycle paths, you name it. You almost get the impression that they offer just about anything to encourage their clients to get active. A cynical person might notch this down to marketing, but it actually turns out there is much more to it than this. Now, if you go on an academic search engine like Google Scholar and search for the keywords alcohol withdrawal and exercise, size, you will get over 10,000 hits. It seems like scientists have also caught onto this phenomenon, and they're studying it like crazy. On the face of it, exercise makes sense for a heavy drinker that's in recovery. The expectation is that this one healthy habit will then attract more healthy habits, like eating and sleeping well. So the more that you crowd the person's lifestyle with healthy habits, the less space for them to poison themselves with ethanol. But there's a little bit more to it than just this. Have you heard that old cliche about how exercise stimulates our body to release endorphins, those feel-good chemicals? Well, it turns out that that is true. And this is part of the reason why we feel so good after going to the gym or going jogging. And exercise especially enhances the release of beta endorphin, the same opioid which, as we just saw, is downregulated in chronic drinkers. This release is proportional both to the duration and the intensity of the exercise. So the longer and more vigorously that you exercise, Exercise, the higher your beta endorphin levels. And when you've recently stopped drinking and are struggling from the effects of lowered beta endorphin, there can be no better remedy than breaking a sweat and naturally raising your levels back up. Multiple studies have found that a structured exercise program not only helps recently recovered heavy drinkers stay abstinent, but it also lowers consumption levels in those who do continue to drink. Now, as immensely useful as exercise and physical activity can be, you'll get the best results when you combine these with a structured program designed to actually help you stop drinking. And if you click the video on the screen now, you can learn why a drinking problem exists with a totally new way for you to gain control.